Good evening, folks. Thank you for joining us. My name is Peter Kajniski. I'm the administrative assistant here at the Global Village Museum. Uh, this will be our third virtual program. We've got two more planned for October for Dia de los Muertos, which is our upcoming exhibit that opens on October 2nd. This evening, we are joined by Charlie Papazian, who is the author of The Complete Joy of Home Brewing, uh, first published in 1984, now in its fourth edition. An American nuclear engineer, school teacher, brewer, and author, Papazian founded the American Home Brewers Association in 1978 and the Great American Beer Festival in 1982. In 1983, he founded the Association of Brewers, which would later merge with the Brewers Association of America in 2005. Um, the complete joy of home brewing has gained iconic status and is referred to as the Home Brewers Bible. Indeed, he's known nationwide as the father of home brewing. Uh, he's written a total of six books on the topic and is the founder of Zimmergy Magazine, a beer making publication named for the science of fermenting yeast for beer or wine. Uh, one of his uh, mantras is the best beer in the world is the one you brewed. And as he's also known to say, um, relax, don't worry and have a home brew. So for those of you at home who are joining us, we hope you can relax, listen, and if possible, enjoy a home brew. And I also ask all of our participants to please refrain from starting their um, video. Because I can slow down our uh, connection. And somebody started a sh screen share that's not Charlie. <laughs> so let's take that permission away real fast. <laughs> All right, I'm going to give you permission, and you'll have you start it again real fast. Okay, ready? Yeah. All right, let's pull up your PowerPoint. No, I'm, I'm going to pull that up later on. Okay. Um, I will just wait until you're ready. Just tell me, and I'll give you permission, okay? Okay. All right. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and kill my video and my audio and let you take it away. All right. I will rejoin you later for Q&A. Good deal. All righty. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I think we're live. And I want to thank Peter for the introduction and also uh, thank the Global Village Museum for having me on the show, so to speak. Um, I'm going to start off the presentation with something I probably couldn't do if I was doing this presentation live. And it's a positive thing. So um, I, I'm going to start off by just uh, relaxing, not worrying, and having a homebrew. Oh boy, what a great way. I wish I could start every presentation I gave that way. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, my presentation is about uh, a century of homebrewing in, in America. But before I start about the last uh, 100 years, I want to lay some foundation by uh, talking a little bit about what was going on, what happened prior to 1920 um, in America. Uh, back in the days when the settlers came over here, over to North America and, and founded our country and colonized here um, and landed uh, along the East Coast and established settlements. One of the first things that they did was um, brew beer. Um, not because they necessarily love beer, but because it was the, probably the safe, one of the safest things that they could be uh, drinking because the water was questionable. And when you brew beer, ferment beer, ferment things that are uh, similar to beer, you uh, create a uh, beverage that is free of uh, pathogenic bacteria and, and other things. It's a lot safer to drink than, than water. And um, when they first arrived, of course, there wasn't barley and hops available. Um, so what they established was a foundation of, of well, they infused the, the, the element of innovation into American brewing. They brewed with what they had and what they could find. 
um, and they're set around their settlements. They brewed with squashes, they brewed with herbs, um, plants, roots, corn, whatever they could find. And they would enjoy that and have, have beer. Um, so that, that creativeness was uh, kind of infused into what I'm gonna talk about uh, later in this presentation is the, is the, part, the part about innovation, which we, have, we are still continuing to do in this country. Um, uh, so that is uh, the earliest uh, premise of home brewing here in this country, what the pilgrims did and what some of the other settlements did. And there's not a whole lot of literature that, that was written about that, but there are two books that um, I would recommend. One is called uh, Wine, The Beers and Wines of Old New England. That was published in 1978 by the Dartmouth College University Press of New England. And that accounts, that, uh, that's a book that uh, accounts for the, uh, the ingredients that the early settlers used to make beer um, and wine. Uh, the other book that uh, was published by the Brewers Association is Sacred Herbal and Healing Beers by Stephen Buhner. That was published in uh, 1998. And that, uh, that has some interesting stories about beers made with various herbs and why they were used in the first place. Um, a lot of herbs were used for medicinal purposes and what better way, what better vehicle to, to put these herbs in than fermented beer. And a lot of that was going on in the early days of this country. Um, so that was essentially the foundation. And in the early days, uh, individual families would, would home brew. That's what they would do. There were obviously no breweries here in the early days, very earliest days. And uh, and, and it's most likely that because the men were out there building and constructing and hunting and gathering um, and tending to uh, settling uh, their community, and the women were, and were likely uh, involved in providing uh, food and beverage and household uh, uh, environment. Um, so it was pretty likely that the brewing was done by women in the early days. And uh, because the men were out busy doing other very essential things as well. Um, so it was, home brewing began in households and as communities developed, there were village breweries and home brewing kept kept going, but village breweries provided a place and a beverage that was e had people had easier access to. And as that and through the years, through the centuries, um, things got bigger and bigger. You know, uh, communities, towns, cities, um, they developed their breweries from uh, local breweries and uh, from village breweries, local breweries, to town breweries, to city breweries, to regional breweries and to national breweries. And that was the progression. And as all that happened, um, beer was more accessible and then the essential need to uh, homebrew was no longer uh, important. But obviously people did homebrew, but there wasn't a whole lot written about it um, and recorded about homebrewing. Uh, more was recorded and more discussion was made uh, regarding the local breweries and taverns and uh, regional breweries, etc. And then we came to the era near the 19, near 1920. We're going to jump it, jump, jump to that point and start our topic for for today. 1920. It was a year that was very close to when prohibition began. And in that time, um, there were a few thousand, a couple of thousand breweries that were registered. There were likely more than that, uh, uh, but uh, a couple of thousand breweries. And for the most part, they were all regional breweries. But the interesting thing was that uh, 
the the uh, consumption of alcohol per capita in those days was extremely high, and there was a lot of abuse, not only with primarily with dis dis distilled spirits, but beer was lumped into that category as well, and the environment with which in which uh, beer was consumed was essentially a man's world. Um, very, uh, there were very few venues, if any, uh, that were inviting for people, for women to socialize and have a beer. It was pretty a decadent scene back in the early 1920s and prior to that. Um, so along came prohibition and the thousands of breweries in America shut down and the whole notion of home brewing to get through prohibition <laughs> emerged. And the interesting thing, the, the theme, the, the reason why people brewed was not because of they wanted to make quality beer, they wanted to make uh, any kind of beer, any kind of alcohol, no matter what it tastes like. And there was very, very little information on how to make beer. Um, I came across a book called um, The Homemade Beer Book by Brest Orton that was published in 1932 by Charles Tuttle Press. And that was an account of brewmasters um, home, making homebrew during Prohibition and thereafter. And it, interestingly, from what I understand, this, this was a group of people in Vermont or in New England and they were German, mostly German immigrants and formerly German brewmasters. And it, it, in that book kind of uh, follows their conversations and uh, what, they, what they were thinking, what they were making. Not, it wasn't necessarily a how-to book about brewing, but But that book really nickel books for making beer on a large scale uh, that breweries used. But that information was pretty, pretty technical for, for a home brewer. So they did the best they can. And the theme again was quantity, not quality. And the beer prohibition style homebrew uh, emerged. And some of it was good. A lot of it was not so good but it probably all got drank and enjoyed one, one way or another. Um, the interesting thing about prohibition was that it created um, the speakeasy, the illegal social environment where people would drink, enjoy alcoholic beverages illegally, whether it would be beer or cocktails or wine or what have you. And it was the first time, if you look at pictures of steep, if you look at pictures, photographs of speakeasies, you see women that were socializing uh, along with a lot of men. Um, and it was more of an environment, a friendlier environment uh, for women to uh, socialize with alcoholic beverages. So if one thing prohibition did do, it, it changed uh, and created a new, an environment, an opportunity, and created the experience of men, both men and women, being able to enjoy alcoholic beverages. Um, emerging from prohibition in the early 1930s, the, the, the country celebrated and they also celebrated and, and embraced the whole idea of indulging and, and, and buying beer again. And home brewing probably really, uh, the interest in home brewing pretty much dropped off. And there still wasn't a whole lot of information about how to make good beer in those days. Um, the, the few references, what we, the few references 
that I've come across in my research over the many years um, indicated that the recipes that we had or they had were pretty crude and made beer, but not very good beer. And I'll, I'll show you the, a little later on uh, a slide of uh, the original recipe that I had, which was from an old timer in Charlottesville, Virginia that shared his homebrew with me. And I fell in love, not necessarily with the beer as much, but I did like, like the beer, but the whole idea of making beer was really intriguing. But we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, another, uh, another story that I, I came across, and we published it in our first issue of Zymergy, and I'm going to show you that. Um, yeah, could you uh, enable me to share the screen again, Peter? You should have permission. Okay, there we go. All right, there we go. This is the very first issue of Zymergy magazine when we, it's that when we founded it in 1978. And the cover story was called The Lost Art of Home Brewing. And this was a reprint of a story that appeared in the American Mercury in 1935. And it was an account of what home brewing was like during Prohibition and shortly thereafter. And it pretty much uh, celebrates the quality when, it, when quality was achieved. But mostly, it really got in. And with it was a, it's a tongue-in-cheek article, and about how labor-intensive home brewing was, and how mysterious and burdened with myths the whole process of home brewing uh, had become. So that kind of sets sets the tone for, you know, the dark ages of home brewing between post-prohibition prohibition until I'd say the 1970s when, when I got involved and the, the, the really the lost art of home brewings began to emerge. One of the other things that I want to share with you right now is that um, after prohibition winemaking, home winemaking was made legal, but home brewing for whatever reason, and they say it was a stenographer's error um, when they, but they legalized home wine making, but they didn't legalize home beer making. So home brewing of beer was illegal on a, on a federal level until 1979. And so um, what we were involved in as home brewers was against the law. And we can, we'll get into that a little bit, a little bit more. But the legacy of home brewing haunted, uh, I know my efforts um, to introduce people to better beer um, for more than 50 years. It was always this legacy that was hung, hang around. You know, the, the first thing, if you said back in the earlier days of, home, of our home brewing endeavors, when you said you were a home brewer, people would almost always say, oh, my father or my grandfather used to brew during prohibition in a bathtub. And litter, and and there were all these stories about exploding bottles, and it was really it was a really a real turnoff for most people. So getting getting through that era, and 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 proving that quality beer could be made one batch at a time and one sample at a time was a very personal. Um, effort by all of us that were involved in, in home brewing. Um, so there wasn't likely a lot of home brewing that was done in the 30s and, and the 40s during World War II. There was a shortage of ingredients. The, the, even the, the, the commercial breweries had a tough time uh, producing beer. Uh, uh, even bottle, there was a bottle cap shortage and a shortage of materials in general. Um, but it did create, the World War II did create um, a, a market for beer um, to be enjoyed by more women. And there, were, there, were, there was lighter beer that was made because of a shortage of ingredients and also um, 
that's what they thought that that would appeal to women and also uh because of a shortage of in, a shortage of ingredients so that that that's an element that plays into the development of home brewing um, and by the time i got involved with home brewing um there were a lot of women that were would have, would like to enjoy beer um but they didn't really appreciate not having the choice um, and the flavors and the diversity that, that we have now. So um, 1950s is post-World War II, and that was an era of also that, that didn't have a lot of home brewing going on because after World War II, um, there was a, a phenomenon that I call the homogenization of America. There was a lot of stuff going on. Um, you know, there was, there was, there were commodity, the, our, our culture was commoditized and, and homogenized. There was the emergence of Wonder Bread. There was the emergence of homogenized milk. There was the emergence of things like Velveeta cheese, faux cheese. Uh, there was, you know, and, and everything else, TV dinners. And that was cool then. That was the American dream everybody um, that was, tr it was trendy and it was embraced. People loved the idea of, of doing less work and enjoying what everybody else was enjoying and being all on the same page um, after, the, after World War II and through the, through the early 50s. Um, there were a lot of regional breweries and there were still some uh, flavor differentials um, and from region to region and choices, and people enjoyed that a lot. But along came a better transportation system, television, and, um, and, and uh, refrigeration became much more commonplace um, post-World War II. And that allowed breweries who wanted to grow and become national breweries, it allowed them to to distribute their beers farther and farther away from where it was brewed. And the emergence of the national breweries uh, began in the 50s and, and to the detriment of regional breweries um, who couldn't keep up and couldn't compete with the, the larger national breweries and television, transportation, better transportation systems and refrigeration and technology uh, all it helped enable that phenomenon to happen. And so we had a, an environment where there were fewer and fewer choices and there was less diversity of types of beers. And in the 1960s and in the 19th, early 1970s, I mean, I was going to high school in the late 60s and went to college in the late late 60s and early 70s and there was absolutely no choice in in beer you drank light american lager um or not not or you didn't drink beer um i drank beer not because i enjoyed the flavor but because i was young and foolish and you know it was uh my introduction to alcohol and i didn't like the beer and, and thank goodness for my discovery of homebrew and thank goodness for craft beer because if that didn't occur i'm sure i wouldn't be a beer drinker today um but um uh, what happened in the 1970 was i was in college at the university of virginia in charlottesville and a friend of mine introduced me to a, uh, an old timer in the neighborhood who was making homebrew. And I said, homebrew? Something I said that everybody else was going to say to me when I introduced them to homebrew. And it was, I didn't know you could homebrew. I didn't know you could make beer at home. How do you do it? And he went down in his basement and got a well-aged bottle of, a quart bottle of, of homebrew and uh, I tried it and I was very intrigued with the flavor. It was, it was, it was good. It wasn't fantastic, but it was good. 
better than what we were buying for 69 cents a six pack. Um, and, and I asked, how did you make this? And I want to share with you the original recipe that he gave me. Oh, are we sharing? Yes, we are sharing. Um, if we're sharing, I should be, oops. I need to go back previous. I don't know why I've lost the zoom here. Let's try it again. Okay, doke. Here we go. This is a uh, four by five piece of cardboard and it's his handwriting. And it was, a, it was my introduction to, re, to, uh, with a, to home brewing with, with this recipe. And a little interpretation, five gallons of, of warm water, one can of malt extract, uh, PBR stands for Paps Blue Ribbon Malt Extract, light or dark, and one and a half cans of sugar, white black, which I didn't know what that actually meant. I guess you get white or brown sugar, more or less, um, depending on how strong you wanted it. Uh, so the, the recipe called for mostly sugar with one, three, three pounds of three pounds of malt and perhaps six pounds of sugar. You mixed it up in the five gallons of warm water with a spoon. Um, and you usually didn't have a spoon that was long enough. So your whole elbow, your elbow, you were up to your elbows <laughs> in water. You'd stir in this thing with one cake of yeast, which was to our knowledge in those days was just, well, bread yeast. And ferment till bubbling, till it stops, seven of days to five weeks, depending on your sugar content and temperature. And the interesting thing is that he has here was that fermented, fermentation best at 45 degrees, which I pretty much ignored that um, because I couldn't get an environment that was 45 degrees, but I'm, certainly I I'm, I'm certain that I would have failed, failed because the yeast that bread, bread is, the, that is used for making bread is pretty much the same yeast as ale yeast. And that doesn't ferment below 60 degrees. So I don't know what I, I probably would have failed if I had an environment for 45 degrees. And, uh, and then bottle, then that was, that was it. And through perseverance and a, and a lot of errors, um, I, uh, I improved the recipe over, over my, during my stint as a, a University of Virginia student. And people really liked what we were making as myself and roommates were making. We had great parties. Uh, there was a recipe that I would give people. And there were, uh, I guess you could call them pods of, of, of students that, were, that would get together and, and make, make homebrew the last two, three years that I was at UVA. Um, and we had a blast. Uh, we enjoyed it. And one of the things that I, I remembered was the whole social aspect and, and how people reacted to this beer was, it was a very friendly environment and people, something about homebrew um, that people respected. And generally, um, the environment was not uh, drunken debauchery. <laughs> it was, it was people asking about the beer and how it was made and appreciating it a lot more than what usually happened at uh, typically at frat parties at UVA. So that was one of my introduction to home brewing in the social environment that, um, that I was involved in. Um, this, this uh, let's see here, sharing again, I want to share. Next slide is the, uh, <clears throat> brew. we call ourselves the Log Boom Brewery. Um, Brewmaster, Naya Zapap, that's my name spelled backward. It does the trick. We had a lot of fun. And somebody, after a few, a few of these, for his first introduction in one of our first parties, blurted out a beer with balls and that kind of stuck forever. Um, and it was brewed at our, our, in Charlottesville, Virginia. It does the trick. So that was, 
that was our logo as as students um, and I was involved thereafter I, I graduated from University of Virginia um, I grew up in New Jersey but I moved out to Colorado in 1972 after I graduated and I left all my brewing equipment back back east and I really didn't have a notion that I was going to pick up home brewing again, but word got around that I knew how to make beer. So the friends that I had made in, in Boulder uh, invited me to teach them how to make beer. And one thing led to another, and I was invited by the community free school um, in Boulder to start teaching home brewing classes. And 1970s, 1972, 1973, 1974, 1975 was an interesting time in our country. There was a lot of things going on that really um, helped the and enhanced the whole idea of teaching home brewing and enabling people to learn something that they would have found difficult to do on their own. Um, first of all, there was a recession, a very deep recession um, in the United States. Interest rates, believe it or not, were at 18% or higher. Um, uh, it was very difficult to find a job. Uh, and so, and also at the time, the, um, there were, uh, the, Airline industry became was uh, deregulated, um, and there was a what I'm going to call a free school alternative school movement that began in Berkeley, California, Boulder, Colorado, uh, I believe in Michigan, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and New York State in Columbia University or thereabouts. But there was there were these three or four pods of alternate ideas on what education could be. And it revolutionized um, the whole idea of community learning, community schools. Um, and and these, these schools, including the Boulder Community Free School, uh, created opportunities for people who, if they wanted to teach something, they could. And, and before that, um, there were there were set curriculums and 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 there was a very narrow range of classes extracurricular classes that people could take outside universities so that in itself helped create an environment where people were welcomed and were able to to uh increase their skills and things that they were interested in doing whether it was bread making weaving or or yoga or in this case home brewing and my early classes uh, were, were taught, all my classes were ta taught out of my home. And uh, interestingly enough, most of the classes were 50% men in, enrolled and 50% women. Um, and we got together, we talked about beer, and we all learned together because I didn't know very much about home brewing. So being able to teach, Beer making was an opportunity for me to learn because I was brewing every week and I was investigating every bit of knowledge that I could find and there wasn't a whole lot of knowledge out there. Most of the books, the limited number of books that you could find were written in the UK and, the, and, the, and home brewing in England was, was based on wouldn't say quantity, but it was a tax dodge because beer was taxed so heavily, it was extremely expensive. And so people wanted, wanted cheap beer and quality was not an essential theme of making beer. And thus all those books that we got were based on myths and other home brewers experience and uh, elements of sugar brews with some malt, malt extract and malt. Um, it was very little technical information in those books. And just to give, as some of you may be home brewers. Yes, I remember one of the things that, that those, all those books had, if you were going to make a stout or a dark beer, you, you would throw, you would use dark grains, roasted grains. That's what makes beer dark. 
but where did that come in the brewing process? Well, it should have come in the mashing process in where you convert your grains to sugars. But in those books, you dump it into the boiling water and boil it for an hour. Um, so, so some of you who are home brewers, if you can imagine uh, boiling black roasted malt for an hour, you get some pretty caustic brews. And of course, those books said, well, if you're gonna make a stout, um, you, you need to age it for two or three months. And of course, aging like um, aging would mellow it out. But um, I'll get to a story later on on um, some, of the, some of the discoveries I made. Um, but we were looking, looking for as much knowledge as possible and we got it uh, by sharing and collaboration and, and, uh, and discussing. I want to show you the, one of the covers of the early issues of Zymergy. Um, oh, I want to, well, let me just show you this. This is, this is the cover of my first book. It was mentioned that my first Complete Joy of Homebrewing was published in 1984. That's true. That's the big volume edition, but I self-published a small volume of 78-page 78 78 uh, volume of The Joy of Brewing and, and handed it out to all my students in my homebrewing class. And that was published in 1976. Um, I want to talk about that a little bit later, but and I, by, by 1980, um, just to give you an idea, this was homebrewing around the country. We were collaborating, we were communicating, and this was the state of things. This cover, cover shows you a few things, and in, this indicates, like this bottle, is a champagne bottle. Bottles were hard to find. Um, you know, you'd have to scavenge in, 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 in alleys and in trash cans to find beer bottles. And one of the things we discovered that if you f could find a wedding party somewhere at a hotel, they were cases and cases of empty champagne bottles that would work well. So this was an image of a champagne bottle. And you can see the technology was essentially a telephone, a wired telephone, people talking to each other from Washington to New Mexico, sharing recipes. Um, there were regional homebrew competitions in, in, the, in the early uh, 80s and uh, late 90s or late 70s. Um, and, and there was there were home, home brewing pods in, in New England and there was a malt manufacturing plant in North Carolina that emerged. But you can see these two ships coming in from the east and that was in, most of the ingredients were being imported from England. Later on, some of the ingredients were being per, imported from Germany, but they were being imported for home brewers. You got to remember that there were no uh, craft brewers in those days, uh, commercial craft brewers. So you know, uh, a picture, you know, there's a lot you can, you can, you can see in this picture or in this cover that kind of indicates the state of affairs. Um, so uh, we shared, we collaborated, um, and, you know, the circumstances in the 70s just, you know, inspired a revolution in brewing, and we began to uh, celebrate the quality of the beers that we were, we were making. Um, again, 1979, it was illegal until, until President Carter signed a bill that legalized it. And this, actually, it was a transportation bill, and there was an amendment added to the transportation bill, and that legalized home brewing. But it didn't legalize it in all 50 states. Every, every state had to legalize Home brewing. It was, and it wasn't until about four or five years ago that Mississippi and Alabama finally were the last two states that legalized legalized home brewing. Um, what we were doing, um, you know, throwing back the throwback to the early days with pilgrims and and pioneers and using the ingredients that they had at hand. Uh, we would get together in my kitchen and homebrew, and my kitchen was just like any other homebrewer's kitchen in those days. And we would be brewing a batch of beer and, you know, staring us in the face would be um, our, my spice cabinet. And we would throw in juniper berries or peppercorns or cinnamon or nutmeg or what have you. Um, we would, one of the earliest uh, 
fruit beers that I ever made was inspired by a cherry wine that somebody gave me. And I was enjoying the cherry wine. And I was, and no, I had the cherry wine bottle on the table. I was enjoying the stout. And uh, I was drinking the stout. And I, and I had this flash of an idea. I wonder what cherry cherries would taste like in beer. So I poured a little bit of the cherry wine into the stout. And voila, I always got to think, this is really good. We, um, we might as well just put the cherries in the beer when we brewed it. And so those kinds of experiences and those kind, that kind of innovation um, was the basis of some of the, the what, was, what were considered really, really wacko ideas. The idea of putting honey in beer. I remember professional brewers saying, it's not beer. You can't put honey in beer. That's just, that's unheard of. But we did, and it turned out that the beer was excellent and refreshing, delicious, and it worked really well. So that whole thing of innovation uh, was was founded. The idea of innovation in the 70s was founded by home brewers, who later became microbrewers, and that innovation kind of spilled over into the uh, microbrewery and craft brewing brewing world. In 1978, I founded the American Home Brewers Association, kind of a, um, out of out of the enthusiasm of my class that, that I was, you know, I, I taught that class for about 10 years. I taught about a thousand people over the years. And um, it was, it was, the idea was to, to share recipes. And I guess we just drank too much good home brew. <laughs> And that idea of sharing recipes became a newsletter that became a magazine that became the American Home Brewers, and that was founded in 1978. Um, and we continued to struggle against the legacy of the prohibition style beer and trying to find stories and articles it was extremely difficult in those days. Most of them were stories of our own experience this in the early days of the magazine. There were a few. Uh, beer enthusiasts that were editors at the Washington Post, and they emerged to, there was a group of them, and they, they researched articles about stout and ales and real ales in, in England and traveled to England, and uh, they brought over, they, they, they wrote stories and, and enlightened us on the whole real ale movement and Irish stout, what Irish stout was all about, and where that, and how that came to be. Um, uh, so the, the information was scarce. And one of the things that was an epiphany for me was going over to England and actually to Europe for the first time in my life, because again, as I said, airline travel uh, was deregulated. More people were traveling to Europe. And, and that was one of the reasons people took my class, because they tasted the beer in Europe and they would come back and say, why can't we make beer like that? Why can't commercial beers make better beer? Breweries make better beer. And, you know, they didn't know how, really. And it was, if you wanted better beers, and there, and there weren't any, any, any imported beers to speak of. There was maybe count, 10 of them. Um, uh, if you wanted those kind of beers, you had to make it yourself. So people who traveled and brought back beers and br brought back experience were also the inspiration for uh, us pursuing more knowledge. But again, 1981, I went to England. Uh, long story, but I'll shorten it here. Um, I traveled as a guest and I was hosted by malt extract companies and malt companies and some hop companies. And I went to many, uh, several breweries and I saw how English real ale was made. And it blew my mind. It was so different than the home brew books that were all <laughs> written in England. Um, and the epiphany happened really um, when I was in Dublin and I was able to tour the Guinness Brewery and I saw that how they made Guinness and I was talking to one of the brewers and I, re and I realized that he told, well, he told me, he said, the beer that we're making today will Irish stout will be served on tap across the street in 10 days. That was so different than anything that any of the home brewing books talked about. So I was really interested in how that could be. 
it was basically thin, simple things. You don't boil black roasted malt <laughs> in your brew pot. You mash it. Um, and if you're going to make, if you're going to have malt extract beer, you just steep it in water. You make a tea with it and add, add it to your, to your recipe. But it was those kinds of experiences. And also some people at Coors were very, very friendly and uh, very outgoing. And they wanted to help us as home brewers because they, you know, these were brewers and they loved the quality of their beer. We appreciated what they were doing. They invited us to tap their, their, uh, the pilot brewery, we tasted their experiments. They, we got to taste George Killian's Irish Red Ale in the experimental stages when it was really an ale and it was really red. Um, and, and, we, and I learned a lot. And that was the basis for my big volume edition of The Complete Joy of Brewing that came out in 1984. And the interesting thing that was the, the industry and the home brewing was a pretty conservative community. Um, the book came out, and I believe it was priced at seven dollars and a half for a three hundred page book and all the other home brewing books were about two or three dollars, and they were about seventy pages to one hundred and twenty pages um, and home brewing shops wouldn 't carry my book because they thought home brewers were cheap skates and wouldn 't pay seven and a half dollars for the book, but enough people were buying my book. Um, in bookstores and coming into the homebrew shops with recipes that they wanted ingredients for uh, and word of mouth was spreading that eventually they really did embrace my book and it kind of elevated that the idea that quality is worth something uh, to pay more money for and people were coming in the store not to make cheap beer but to make good beer and that was you know, that was that legacy of prohibition that we're still trying to get over with, get through. Um, so all that happened and things began to take off. Uh, home brewing became quite popular, but it really wasn't um, something that was mainstream yet in the 80s, um, the 90s. You saw classic, most people brewing classic beer styles of the world, the English ales, the German style lagers, and also Belgian ales were beginning to be introduced into this country. There wasn't a whole lot of knowledge about Belgian style beers. And that, ha that began in the, in the 90s. And it was home brewings at first, that home, home brewers that were first seeking those beers and first brewing those beers. And, you know, those were the first taste, those beers that made here in this country that people had. And that was, that spilled over again to the craft brewing uh, and microbrewing business that, that, that emerged. So there was a, still a lot of experimentation, there's always been a lot of experimentation with ingredients, techniques, new and traditional ingredients, uh, root beers, um, Fruit beers and American wheat beers were really uh, a trend in the, in the 90s. Um, quality, one of the other things that happened with home brewing was that home brewers went into business supplying better access to better ingredients. For example, hops were always unpackaged and old and stale. And it was home brewers who first figured out that home hops should be vacuum bag vacuum packed in nitrogen ma to maximize their freshness and keep it keep hops fresh it was home brewers who did that first it was home brew shops first the big, the big hop companies did that later but that was a thing that um home brewers did it was home brewers who um made quality yeast accessible because if you wanted yeast in the early days you either had to pay hundreds of dollars to get a yeast strain from a yeast bank or know somebody at a large brewery <laughs> um, and you you were you were relegated to just using dried yeast and the quality of dried yeast was pretty crappy in those days it made it made okay beer but you didn't have the diversity and the opportunity to make truly world-class beer so you know there's there was y yeast and white labs home brewers who um, made a business of uh, producing hundreds of strains and, and keeping bank, banking, yeast banking, hundreds of strains of yeast and presenting it to home brewers so that they could make 
beers from a variety of yeast. The Germans got involved and they started importing malt and their ingredients and their, their knowledge. And, and um, they loved what home brewers were doing because home brewers love beer. And that's, what, that's the premise of what Germans, German beer industry was all about, loving beer. And that whole thing was a new experience. The Great American Beer Festival, which I founded, was done by was founded by the American Home Brewers Association. It was run by home brewers, and it brought together the existing breweries in 1982. And I remember brewmasters and and remember a guy named Fred Huber, who owned who, who was a family member of an owner of the Huber Brewing Company out of Wisconsin. And he was sitting down at a table in Boulder, Colorado, watching, you know, about a thousand older home brewers enjoying the Great American Beer Festival under one roof where beers were being served by 40 different breweries. And he said, I never thought I'd ever see this day in my life, where number one, that there would be multiple breweries at a festival serving their beer to the public. And number two, which is the big deal, so all these people were talking about the beers that they were drinking. They were there not just for drinking beer, but they wanted to learn about what this beer experience was all about. So that again was, was home brewers that um, founded the whole premise of, of uh, flavor and diversity and appreciating quality and learning about the beer and enhancing our beer exper experience. Um, you know, in, two, in the 2000s, I'm going to end here soon so we have some time for questions. In the 2000s, you had, you had the extreme beer experience, the high alcohol, triple box, and super strength beers, and super imperial this and super imperial that. That was all the rage, and that was a trend. But that was also home brewers who, were, who did that first, and, and microbrewers tasted these things, and... Um, thought, hey, let's give it a try. And um, here we are now in 2020, and they, we have another trend called uh, you know, hazy, fruity, um, and extreme beers are still, are st still exist. But it's the home brewers, I think, that are, are, are still being innovative. They're today are still being innovative. They're still experimenting. They're still making extreme beers and barrel-aged beers and sour beers, um, but they're also, for the most part, making the traditional uh, beers that we we grew up with back in the 70s and 80s. You know, the English ale, the various English ales, the various German beers, the various traditional Belgian ales, and we seek that history and those historical historical brews that were long lost and we appreciate that and you don't you don't see that as much these days in local pubs you see you're more if there's 10 taps you're more likely to see about seven hazy beers and maybe one stout and maybe a pilsner and maybe one ale um, but i think there'll be a time when there'll be people will continue to pre pre appreciate fruity hazy beers um, IPAs, etc., but they'll the trend to diversity will will circle around again. And a good Irish stout or a good English pale ale or an original American pale ale, which is I'm getting near the end here. That's what this is. This is a, a, a I call it my retro pale ale. It's uh, made with Cascade hops that I grew myself, um, but it's a pale ale that would have been that we would have made back in the 90s with, with Cascade hops. And it would have, it would have been five and a half percent American style pale ale. And boy, that tastes good after an hour of talking, I'll tell you that. Um, and it's sessionable. And personally, I think I talk to more and more people that when they go out and, and have a beer, they, they, they are beginning to seek a little bit less alcohol um, brewing them themselves because it's harder to find lower alcohol IPAs and pale ales and stouts um, and, and being able to have two or three beers when you go out rather than just one and calling it a night um, or an evening. So 
that's my uh, my talk, and I'm glad I could share with you some of my experiences. And I think I had a few other pictures I forgot to show you here. Let's see here. I'm going to be a few more images that I forgot to do. Okay, let's see here. I don't think I'm. Uh, I, am I still able to share? You should be. Um, I can okay. still see your screen, so. Okay. It keeps going black. I guess oh, um, hit on the left left key on your arrow keys. Left arrow key? Okay. All right. If you're trying to go back slides. All right. I'm just actually, let's see. I'll share one more. I'll give it one more try here. No. There's something screwy. That doesn't matter. I, I said things that uh, that were important, so. <laughs> and so well, we're drinking beer. I'm drinking beer. I don't know about you folks out there, but I hope you have a beer in hand. I'd love to have a beer in hand, but I'm in my office, so uh, not an option for me. But I'd like to thank you personally for uh, kicking off this whole diversity in beers thing so that I can go have a few different kinds of beer when I want to instead of just an American light lager, so. Yeah, at this time, um, I'm going to open it up to Q&A. Folks, if you've got any questions for Charlie, please put them in the chat, and I will ask him. Um, I see one already. It's not really brewing related. Um, Kevin McCann asks, where can I get a shirt like that? <laughs> People ask me that. They don't make these anymore, but I, yeah, these were pretty pretty popular back in uh, back about 15 years ago, <laughs> so that gives you <laughs> how old the shirt is. Oh, yeah. You know, I used to be one of many in the room that were wearing these shirts. Now I'm the only one. Oh, man. So uh, search the thrift stores, it sounds like. Um, Andrew Smith asks, what are you brewing this fall? Well, I have three beers uh, in the fermenter right now. I have a smoke wild Hoptoberfest, I call it, because uh, it's called wild because I use some of my wild hops that I'm cultivating. I found them on my property. Uh, and I cultivated the wild hops, but it's not exclusively wild hops, but it's an Oktoberfest beer, with uh, smoked Oktoberfest beer. And then I have a, uh, uh, what I, close to style, you could call it a Czech style golden lager, kind of a Pilsner, but a little too dark for Pilsner, and I dry hop it with French hops. So German and Czech brewers, traditional brewers, wouldn't dry hop their, their lagers, but I do. So it's, they're unique. So both of those, all my beers are a little bit unique. I have a mild, an English mild, an amber English mild, which is pretty traditional actually, um, using Kent Golding hops from England and such. And then on tap, I have two pale ales, one with experimental hops and the one, and the one I'm drinking with Cascade hops. I have, a, I have an Irish stout and I have a, uh, Yeah, a couple of other beers, but I'll be actually, and I'll also be brewing really soon this fall uh, a Pilsner, a light Pilsner, German style Pilsner with a hop that I harvested that I grew from a cutting um, of a wild hop that I discovered on an island off the coast of Maine. That was a year ago in July, and I got, I got, I took the, I cut the, I Root, a root, root cutting and I brought it home to Colorado and I grew it and within one year I had an amazing harvest. Um, and so this hop is really different than any other hop that I'm growing and I'm gonna try, I'm gonna make a pilsner and I'm gonna dry hop it and flavor hop it so I really get this, the aroma of the hop and the flavor of the hop to see what it, it, what it's like. So it's not a true German pilsner because they wouldn't dry hop, they might lay late hop, but. So that's going to be uh, an exciting experiment. Oh, that sounds really interesting. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, I had that's no so idea. so cool. But it was on the foundation of an old lighthouse keeper's uh, building that had been destroyed. Um, this lighthouse was built on when Thomas Jefferson was president. Oh, wow. Um, so it's a real historical place. But th there were these hop vines growing around the foundation of where a house once stood. And it was probably brought over, who knows, you know, a hundred years ago or yeah. planted on the island by, you know, 
I can only imagine some German immigrant or German who just thought they, you know, they're going to be bivouacked on this island for a year or two. They wanted to make beer. And they planted some hops. I mean, can't I can't imagine. So I imagine they're some kind of German hop. Cool. Yeah. Uh, this comes from our one of our students, Natalie. Um, what do you think of your title, the father of American home brewing? <laughs> Well, it's better than the grandfather of home. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'll call, I'll call the godfather of craft brewing and the father of home brewing. Um, you know, whatever works. I, I, uh, you know, it makes feel, people feel good calling me names. You know, they've always <laughs> bounced off me, good or bad. <laughs> I keep doing what I'm doing, and I love, I love the interaction. Um, you know, if you've ever met me at the beer festival which sadly will be virtual this year. Um, but, uh, you know, I love meeting people and you guys, you, all of you come from all walks of life uh, and have interesting stories. And, you know, all, most all the beers I make are based on a story and an experience I had. And I'm trying to replicate that memory, um, whether it's right. a shootout I had in Dublin or a beer in a beer garden in Germany or an ale house or a, cool brewery in here in the United States. Um, it's all about people and experiences. Right. So this comes from Shelley Parker. Um, where did the idea of Professor Surfate come from? I don't know if I said that right. Yeah, Surfite. 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 Um, it was in the early days of, it was in the first issue of Zymergy, Professor Surfite, which was my alter ego, so to speak. It was kind of a way that I could be zany. And, and the word surfite means overindulgence in food and drink. So it was kind of tongue in cheek uh, right from the beginning. But the knowledge that I had was authentic and people appreciated kind of the lighthearted approach of uh, getting answers to their, to their questions and you know it was fun because people would have these really silly things that they would ask and i'd get serious about it and sometimes they'd have serious things and i'd get silly about it so but it would all all be authentic information that was was useful and scientific uh with a little bit of element of art and mm -hmm. um, you know i i didn't mention that i got a degree in engineering at uva so that all that that scientific approach to things and the in practical approach kind of came in handy when trying to figure out how to make beer and to decipher the tech the the technology of, of brewing the textbooks that, that were that were in existence and kind of in transition translating it into something that that um, anybody could read and understand and uh, get over their fears I mean one of the biggest things that people um, had, was the it was intimidating to try something new that's that's true of all of us and that was where that relax don't worry i have homebrew <laughs> homebrew st started was hey relax don't worry you're gonna make mistakes you know but they're gonna be good ones and you know you know may not may not end up with something you were planning on but it's gonna be just as good in another way right so this is another question from uh, andrew smith what are some singular beer experiences you had abroad and back home Oh, well. I'll make it easy. Give me, give me just like the best one you can think of. Well, one of the first ones was just being in, in real ale pubs and drinking fresh real ale or being in Dublin and, and drinking that fresh stout, 3.8% fresh stout, 10 days old, mm -hmm. and saying, I'll, you know, I'm not going to be able to buy this experience from a bottle that I buy in the store. <laughs> I got to make it myself. Um, and so um, there's, there are a few others. There's another one. Let me just, another one is uh, in Prague, there's a, a 400 year old brew pub, the oldest brew pub in the world called um, uh, Uflecto. And they, they only serve one beer. It's a dark lager four and a half, five percent, and that's all they drink. And it was so good. And the experience of being this in this, this, this labyrinth of little rooms and people enjoying this beer was wonderful. 
And, you know, the beer wasn't anything spectacularly great, but it was delicious. And so I make that, I figured out a way to make that beer taste the way. And whenever I taste it, whenever I make it, and whenever I taste it, it brings me back to the, the, the experience I had in Prague. So those are a few examples. I love that. That's so fascinating. That's, you know, I missed that about my time in Europe was being able to get, you know, a hand cask, something that had been brewed a few days ago. That was just so fantastic. And there's at least one brewery right by my house that does a cask uh, scotch ale and I love it so much. And I sip it and right then I'm back in Scotland, you know? Well, people all what's my favorite beer? And it's usually, the simple answer is the freshest one. <laughs> Fresh beer is always the best beer. And in my house, the freshest beer is my homebrew. So that's, that's my favorite beer. But when I travel, when I go somewhere, it's, you know, I'm, I, I gravitate towards a place where the beer didn't have to go very far, maybe from one side of the wall to the other or across town. Uh, it's really special. Yeah, you can mm. take Oh, yeah. I think this is an interesting question from Gene. Um, how many professional brewers today in the United States come out of a home brewing background versus like a formal training? And has that changed a lot over time? I don't think it's changed a lot over time. I start, I pretty much, well, I actually continue, whenever I visit a brewery and I've visited thousands, whenever I visit a brewery, I always ask the question of the brewer, how'd you start? And Oftentimes, you say from your, from your book, <laughs> or you know, I, I was a home brewer, um, and I got your book and someone else's book, you know, or um, but I, and from those all those conversations, random conversations, um, I would say to answer your question, I say ninety to ninety five percent of the craft brewers today were. Initi initiated their beer experience as a home brewer or through home brew. Um, and, you know, it might not be so much now because there's so much access to good beer and knowledge and going to school and learning how to make beer without being a home brewer. So it's probably a little bit less, but it's not just becoming a brewer. You, you need to develop that enthusiasm and that fire of innovation right figuring things out because when you're a small brewer things don't always work out exactly by the way the book tells, it, tells you that it's going to work out and you got to figure things out on the fly and that's what home brewing is all about and that's what craft small brewing is about and to be able to persevere um you can't be stodgy and you can't just go by the book you got to have that passion and enthusiasm for what you're making and, and that comes from home brewing yeah, I've heard that, that, you know, that brewing is part science, part art. And I think that you really encapsulated that. So, here's an, this is from Robin. I'm sorry if I say your name wrong. Simane, I think. Uh, what do you think, why don't, why do you think more craft breweries don't make Belgian, not counting wits, because they say, quote, there's no market for them. Um, I kind of agree with that. I, you know, I'd like to see more Belgian beers because I'm a big fan, so. Uh, do you think it's true that there's not a market for them anymore? Um, I know Robin's maybe beer class on that island. That, uh, they, they asked that if it was Whitehead Island. Island, yeah. <laughs> and Whitehead in Maine. So they know exactly what I'm talking, where those hops came from. They were there. Um, that was quite a, that was fun. Um, so you're saying that you are observing that there are less and less Belgian style beers av available. Um, so that's news to me because I don't buy a lot of beer, <laughs> but, <laughs> I get, but I go out a lot and I go see, you know, the, the, the trend right now is for hoppy, fruity, fuzzy, hazy, milkshake, pastry, whatever you call them, these hazy IPAs and they're dominating the taps and they're you know, it's kind of working, go, in a way it's going backwards and that it's creating less diversity. And that's gonna, some, somewhere along the line, the bottom is gonna fall out or partly fall out. And that diversity is gonna come back because people are gonna miss those other styles. So 
you know, is there a market for them? Man, when, when, we, when we were introduced to Belgian ales, we were all newcomers to the whole idea of Belgian ales. So evidently there's a lot of people who haven't experienced Belgian ales today. And when they do, and when it becomes available, I mean, it's, it's the marketplace. It's like how much shelf space do you have? You can, you can, put, can you put all these styles on, on one shelf, particularly when, when they're dominated by hazy beers because that's what people want to spend money for right now? Um, it's kind of marketplace dynamics. But, right. you know, those are trends, and they, 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 they don't last forever. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm getting, you know, in Fort Collins, the hazy IPA thing is just in full swing, and I'm getting a little sick of it too. So, uh, you're you're absolutely right. Like, you know, how many do you need to choose from? Exactly. I go to one of my favorite bars, and that's like eight of the ten beers. I'm like, can I get something else? Like, here's a question from uh, uh, George Schroeder: What's your favorite brewery, and did you ever want to open your own? Oh, well, let me ask the second question first. Did I ever think of opening my own brewery? Yes. I thought about it a lot. And I thought about it so much, that's the reason I didn't do it. Because <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole different thing than home brewing. Yeah, yeah. it becomes real work then. <laughs> and it's, it's another approach to making beer. And it's a good approach, but, you know, it's... It, it didn't fit where I, what I wanted to do. And that's a very personal choice that I made. But it's a wonderful, wonderful road to take um, if you want to be involved in the world of, of brewing and professionally. It's a really, really interesting. And so what was the first question? It was... Uh, Who was your favorite brewery? Oh, what was my favorite brewery? My own, of course. It's the fresh, the one that is closest to me. Exactly, the freshest beer. <laughs> You know, and the closest brewery to me right now is either Upslope in North Boulder or Oscar Blues and Lions or Wibby or some brewery in Longmont. So those are close breweries. So They've got smoked hot wings at Oscar Blues that are just phenomenal. Oh, man. All right, here's a question from Charles Gunkini. Uh when he first started home brewing, he says there's a lot of hopped malt extract on the market, and he's curious what the deal with that was because he says it was pretty terrible. Well, in the early days, malt extract in general didn't really fly off the shelves really quickly. I mean, you could get it in the grocery stores, and there were so few home brewers. I mean, that stuff would stay there for months. And just like anything, I mean, it would get old and when home brewing became popular and malt extract you could get fresh malt extract you could really tell the difference between the quality of the beer you were making but hop extract hop flavored malt extract was pretty much all that was available to the earliest of us that were home brewing you wanted hop i didn't even know what hops looked like the first three years i made beer and that's that's I can't I, I'm not exaggerating. It was hop flavored malt extract syrup, and you dumped it in. Oh, it's hops in it. What, I didn't know what hops looked like. And then finally, when it became available, they had these brown bricks that were wrapped in paper that you could buy at the homebrew shops. And when you opened it, it smelled kind of like you know, catty and skunky and crumbled in your hand like with dust. And that was it. <laughs> was a quality we were working with so um the, the hopped extract was better than the, the hops <laughs> in the store that was one of the reasons it existed but a lot of those malt extracts um got a bad rep because people who used them at first were using like you know three pounds of malt extract and eight pounds of sugar cane sugar and it made it made real cidery it made what they called beer it didn't taste like beer but it tasted okay um but if you may had good brewing techniques and you use that and you had some fresh hop flavored malt extract, you can make good beer. You could, I remember uh, the American Home Brewers Association, one guy won first place in the pale ale category and he was in the crowd and he got up to his, 
got up and cut his trophy and as he walked back he was screaming it was a malt extract beer <laughs> <laughs> All right, this might uh, inflame some prides. Uh, Andrew Smith asks, what's your favorite beer city? Beer city? Oh. Whew. No, don't have a favorite. It is no. No thing. You know, when there's so much good beer out in the world, you can't have a favorite. You know, it's like the envir your favorite environment. You know, sometimes you're in the mood to be <clears throat> near a beach or in the forest and... Uh, you know, uh, or in the city, um, or hearing music, or having a good dinner. It's it's just it depends on your mood, really. And there's, so, there's too many good places out there. It's a good answer. Uh, Jacob asks. I fi he says I finally have the opportunity to ask this. Are there still bottles of prickly pear mead hidden on Mead Mountain? There should be. There should be. <laughs> Yes, there should be. I look up there every every so often saying, I wonder if I'll ever make it up there again. I think I can. And I'm sure that the, the mead's up there. I've had 10-year-old, 15-year-old samples of mead that has survived the elements at 8,000 feet. And, uh, How did it age? Really well. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Uh, so, Robin Shemaine, thank you for correcting my pronunciation. Um, this question is, um, given a huge range of styles, what's your first choice? You know, what's your favorite style of beer? Well, this summer, it was, I was hot and thirsty a lot. So, during that period, it was that golden lager I was telling you about. That was kind of like a Czech lager. It was made with floor bohemian floor malt and some French hops that taste like German noble hops. And I, it was just five and a half percent. I just love just gulping that down. <laughs> Either in a Pilsner glass, if I was in the mood. I mean, the glassware is all part of the experience too. Pilsner glass or a German half liter mug. Um, or when there are too many flies outside. I have the lidded, lidded mugs, you know, or, or yeah, yeah. stone stein, depending on my mood. <laughs> this is another one from uh, George Schroeder. Uh, he had asked if you would mind sharing the prog recipe you spoke about. That is in my book, I'm sure. Um, it's called Creekside Dunkel. And it's either in my homebrewer's companion or the, the fourth edition of the complete joy of home brewing. And I, think, right. I think I call it Creekside Dunkel. All right, I'll probably, we'll probably call it quits after this last question. Um, it comes from Lisa, our outreach coordinator here at the museum. Uh, she sent this to me beforehand. She clearly did her research. Um, she asks, uh, she understands that the Mu Smithsonian's National Museum of American History requested some items from you for its collection. Uh, what were those items? Well, You'd be surprised what they wanted. <laughs> um, they, the, the highlight, I guess, was the wooden spoon. I gave them one of my very first wooden spoons that was used in my beer classes in the 70s. And it was very iconic because that spoon was, was used by maybe a thousand people and, and stirring the pot. We were stirring a revolution. So that was a spoon that stirred a revolution <laughs> one brew at a time in my kitchen and during the 1970s. And then the other, I, I, uh, an original copy of that book, uh, Joy of Brewing that I showed you, um, a two page mimeograph, uh, copy of a mimeograph handout that I had in the University of Virginia of how to make beer. Um, there's a, I was, I was in my brew garage a couple of years ago, this is when they asked me, I was in my brew garage and I knew that they wanted stuff. And, um, they, and I was looking, I had a trash can in my garage, it had a liner in it. And I was looking at it and I said, huh, that's my original garbage pail I used to brew beer in back in the seventies. And it started leaking, so I didn't use it anymore. And I, you know, I, I was on the phone with them once and I just, joked with him. I said, I, you know, I, I, I tell him a story. I, I just looked at something and, it was a German, and I had this garbage pail. It was my original pail. I said, we want it. We want it. Can you send it to us? 
<laughs> so I sent them that, and I sent them a bottle of one of the, the bottles of, of, of grocery store ginger ale um, that, I, that we use in Charlottesville, Virginia, that we put our homebrew in back when the first homebrew was in 1970. And there's a, there's a step ladder that I use in my brewing. So there was these little funky things that were kind of iconic as far as, you know, wh what I use on a day-to-day -day basis uh, to make beer. Right. Nothing sh bright and shiny. The, the, tools, the tools of the trade. No Mercedes or Teslas or anything, just kind of. <laughs> All right, this will probably be the last question. This one's for me. Um, why is the brew spoon the hero? Why is the brew spoon the hero? Because it's charismatic. That's, you know, that's what you got to do. You got to put some your own charisma into that spoon and it transfers your charisma into the beer. And that's what makes beer good. Excellent. I love it. Well, thank you very much, Charlie. That was fascinating. Such a, such an, a, just a fascinating and important part of our history as a nation that I think is going to, I think your legacy is going to live on for a very, very long time. You know, every time I sip a beer, I'm going to think about you now. Yeah, well, cheers to all of you. Hope you're somewhere that either you can have a beer soon or you're having one right now. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks again, Charlie. Um, okay. Yeah, and for everyone else, this will be available if you'd like to watch the playback in a few days on our YouTube. Um, and uh, if you're interested in our upcoming talks on Dia de los Muertos, tickets are available on our website. So, thank you very much. Cheers. Good night, everybody.